White Sox podcast coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him at Eckerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. We would love if you gave a thumbs up to the video along with the comments from Justin Matthew and the untold truth as well as subscribing to our channel if you haven't yet. We're closing in on 50,000 subscribers. The Cubs show just wrapped up. We got the White Sox for the next hour. The Bulls are currently live. We'll have a Blackhawk show later we have you covered for everything chicago so much in fact we are sending two people all the way to arizona and one of them is the blue vinnie duber you can follow him at vinnie duber he's our chgo white Sox beat writer uh hi vinnie had i known i was going to be uh you know have just nothing but sky as my backdrop i would have worn a different color shirt but uh you'll have to follow my floating head uh you know here as i'm uh, out in the cloudless uh, land of arizona I just kind of like that your color hat and your sweatshirt matches the sky. You kind of just blend in and you're just a head and it's kind of fun. I, I don't I don't I don't hate it. Um, let's talk about today because it seemed like a busy day. Day three of spring training. You can go back and check out the shorts that Vinny made on day one and day two. The three things that he learned from those days. You can obviously go back and listen to the two hours that we've done already uh, recapping day two and day three. But it seems like the big news is Chris Getz addressing Mike Moose. Stockis, the new uh, face at camp, uh, along with the Dylan Cease trade rumors, as well as Michael Soroka and Michael Kopech addressing the competition that we've heard so much about for that White Sox rotation. Anything else that we're going to be getting into on day three that we're missing into? Do you want to start with your hike? <laughs> yeah, I was able to squeeze in a hike. I was I was getting worried when they when it said when it said 37 minute drive from Camelback Ranch to the trailhead. I was like, oh boy, I don't know if I'm going to be have time for this and then make the show. But I, I I I was able to squeeze it in, and so there you go. There's some lovely pictures from from South Mountain. What is that? What are you pointing at? That the would city? be the city of Phoenix. Yeah. Oh, okay. All the right. view. Yeah. Uh, I've never been. I don't know. I'm I'm so sorry. Maybe that was maybe that was Glendale. I know Glendale and Phoenix are apparently close. Uh, was it a was it a good walk? Is it, is this a good hike you've done before? You know, is this uh, you know just glad to be back or is this a new experience? Uh, first time on this trail, uh, and uh, it was a bit of a workout. I got really sweaty. Uh, it was really hot. Uh, it, you know, once I got moving, obviously I had, uh, you know, whether whether this was a good idea or not, I had long sleeves and long pants. You know, to uh, I guess get get my get get sweaty a little bit and boy did it work so um, I was able to uh, uh, get a good workout today going going up up and down and up and down and up and down so it was it was nice it was nice to be uh, high up on a mountain. Do you encounter any snakes or any scorpions or any members of the group scorpions? Uh, no, they're all in Germany or. I don't know if they're all alive, but uh, uh, the uh, no nothing dangerous up there. I saw a couple of desert quail, but uh, I, I feel like had they charged me, I could have taken them. We're happy you're safe, Vinny. That is what Thank I you, always Sarah. worry about in Arizona, just all the wild animals just running around all the goddamn time. I, I, I've, never seen a snake, I've never seen a snake or a scorpion out here. Hmm. I've seen coyotes, but that's about it. Chain Dome just walking around every day. Oh hey, look at you! Um, I'm, I, I think, I think, all, I think all, I think all the, I think all the scorpions are alive. Uh, no, okay. Anyway, here they are. Rock them on. like a hurricane. Yeah, they. Do they have anything else? Probably not. All right. Uh, they got some good songs. Do they? Oh yeah. It I believe here. they even have one called Arizona, which is fitting. 
It's weird. very fitting. Yeah. Uh, probably, probably know so much about it. They, they were inspired to write a three-minute song. Uh, anyways, let's get into the actual White Sox news. Uh, the biggest thing that at least the comments are talking about is Mike Moustakis, the 69th name invited into White Sox camp. This is a minor league deal. We have about two minutes of Chris Getz speaking on Mike Moustakis. Why don't we hear from Chris Getz first, and then we'll hear from Vinny Duber, who filmed Chris Getz. So here is Chris Getz on Mike Moustakis and why he was brought into White Sox camp this year. Uh, well, you know, you look at, you know, how productive he was for the Rockies early on in the season last year. Um, and, um, yeah, there is there is a, a relationship that not only Pedro has with him, but I do as well. And, you know, when, when you know, knowing Mike um, and, you know, when he has something to truly prove, he wants to, to, to prove that he can still go out there and, and be a productive major league player. Um, you know, know, knowing that he has that baked into uh, his mindset right now, um, I felt like this was a good idea. Uh, granted, you know, there's it's a minor league deal. Um, he's got to uh, show us what he's capable of doing. Um, you know, but to, to have someone of, of his pedigree, obviously he's 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 been to two World Series, he's won a World Series, um, you know, he's he's been an all star and so to have him come in here um, and uh, you know, be around the guys and compete for a spot. It seemed like a, um, you know, very obvious move to make um, and, and excited to, to have him uh, be part of this group. Whenever uh, you, you acquire another uh, Kansas City Royal, there's always a reaction out there from fans. Oh, it's another one. But it's it's sort of, does it stem from just the natural relationship and connection you have with the Royals? Uh, I think it's more the individuals. Um, you know, I, you know, you know, and speaking to Moose, um, yeah, we've got, you know, a, a history, both teammate and, and I was in the office over there, but we're, you know, we've, we've, we've become friends through the years and I know what he can bring to the table, most importantly as a player. Um, and it allowed me to get, uh, you know, a different type of access, perhaps, um, you know, why wouldn't you take advantage of something like that? I've got great respect for, for, for the person, um, the player, the family and, you know, but you know, I, we want them to come out here and be productive to help us win ball games, and that's uh, you know the most important thing. But when it comes to a connection with Royals, it's it's I look at the individual, and if it happens to give me the benefit because there there is a longer history, so be it. I don't know what it looked like when he played second base, but is that something that's even in the mix for him, or what do you what do you envision him? Uh, yeah, I, I I want him to come in here, and, and we'll see how he looks offensively. Obviously, he's got a long history at third base, and, and he can play first base. Um, it's really about the, the bat, but I know he's in great shape, and we'll see how where that plays out. I don't want to limit him either. Another guy with something to prove. We've heard a lot about internal motivation, whether it be from Chris Getz or Pedro Griffol. Mike Moustakis is 35, but Vinny, it's your favorite type of White Sox signing this year. It's another Royal. It's your favorite storyline being dredged up again. Could you just start maybe begging Chris Getz to knock it off? It's funny. I think I've told the story on here before. Chris Getz in 2012 was the first major league player I ever interviewed in a major league clubhouse. I think Mike Moustakis might've been the second, uh, you know, their lockers were right <laughs> down from each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they were both part of that Royals team that I covered as an intern way back when. Uh, but listen, um, this is a minor league signing. This is a guy who's a non-roster invite to camp. This is not the big free agent acquisition of the off season, right? This is, Hey, come to camp. And if you can hit the way that you used to hit, and which is getting to be many years ago, because I don't think he's been an above average major league hitter since 2019, um, then, hey, now we're talking about a spot on this roster for you. Uh, but if he doesn't, then no harm, no foul, right? I mean, this is kind of uh, a, a very low risk situation. What is interesting is we've talked all year about the guys that they've added at the major league level uh, as being defense first, right? As being, uh, you know, oh, well, well, we'll hope here that the uh, that the, the, the Moncadas and the Eloys and the Benintendis, uh, you know, come around and, and they make the offense better. Here's a guy now in Moustakis where Chris Getz is coming out and saying, listen, we got him to see what's in his bat. And uh, we'll, we're not worried about it being a positional need. They don't 
they didn't go out and sign him to a minor league deal because they need a backup first baseman for Andrew Vaughn or they want to take uh, starts away from Yohan Moncada at third base. This is, hey, what can you do? And if I'm looking at the White Sox roster, this is now a competition to see who can be the lefty power bat off the bench between Mike Moustakas and Gavin Sheets. And that really uh, is what jumps out at me. But listen, this is uh, this is a guy that needs to prove it to the White Sox that he even deserves to be considered for his job on the major league roster. Uh, this is a minor league deal for a guy who hasn't put up big offensive numbers in, in quite a while now. My thoughts exactly, Zvini. Um, this, I think raises the floor slightly because I would rather have Mike Moustakis than Gavin Sheets be the lefty power bat. And and power is also a very, I put those in quotes for Mike Moustakis at his age right now. But is he better than Gavin Sheets handling the bat versus right-handers? I believe so. And I don't know if Gavin has any more options left. They could still keep Gavin while having Mike Moustakis making the team. As you said, if Mike Moustakis is cash like many of us think it is, no harm, no foul. He could just be cut by the end of spring training, and you have the roster that you have. So, yes, I just point out that there's another former Royal on the team. I'm having fun with it at this point, but I don't sweat over Mike Moustakis being an actual White Sox because more than likely he won't play a lot. Well, and also, too, I heard Whit Merrifield's closing down on his decision, so we'll see if another Royal pops up, uh, just because, again, I've had that feeling in my stomach. I, I don't care. I, I, would, I would go wild for Whit Merrifield. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it would I be wouldn't. the biggest I'm, sign of the offseason. I, I would not care. It would be the biggest um, offseason. No? No. Uh, Fetty? Huh? Who would be bigger? Fetty? Fetty, and I also just don't care about Whit Merrifield. Mm. Why do you want another 35-year-old? I don't know. Anyways. Um... No offense to my 35 year old out there. Uh, I was going to say, you're I'm one year away from right being there. very offensive. One year away from being very offensive. I'll agree with you for now because I'm, I'm, I'm so much younger than that. But if this was next year and you were saying that, I'd be real mad. With all your hiking, you're like 32. Don't worry. Um, anyways, I, I, I don't care too much about the whole royal thing because, again, connections are connections. This is Chris Getz's first year, and we don't really have high expectations for this. We'll see what 2025 looks like. Is this more royal connections that we see stretched out for the White Sox, or will we see more of a directed push to improve this team? As we can tell, 2024 is more about maybe setting the example, and the White Sox know that these guys can set examples. They're not good at baseball, and that's the big thing. Uh, he mentions, Chris Getz, the time... Uh, Mike Moustakas spends in Colorado, but nothing really jumps off from whether it is facing right-handers uh, in that time for, uh, up to June twenty uh, or yeah June twenty first, uh, or even in his time with the Angels. From his time with the Rockies, he had an average exit velocity of eighty eight point six. Not really uh, hitting the ball that hard with the Angels. That was at eighty nine point four, a little harder, uh, which is surprising as we know because uh, bat speed by month. When you have a thirty five year old, it dips and dips and dips. Uh, so I, I don't really love the signing, but it does also seem like no harm, no foul. I know that he does have better numbers against right handers than Gavin Sheets did. So again, is this just can he provide? May, not even two hundred at bats against right-handers, but can he give you a decent 150? You know, I mean, we've seen Matt Carpenter have a little bit of a revitalization in his later years, so it doesn't mean that, you know, Mike Moustakis is done, but doesn't look good. And technically, Mike Moustakis can play multiple positions, first base, short, shortstop, may, maybe shortstop, second base, and third base is his, mom, his primary spot that he played. I think he played at a below average uh, pace last year, but Gavin now is just pretty much a designated hitter backup for his baseman. So, yes, if Mike Moustakis shows any type of old Mike Moustakis in this spring training, I believe that his that spot is his, and Gavin Sheets will be relegated either to AAA or just DFA'd outright. Uh, any more first thoughts? First of all, Herb, oh. first of all, Herb uh, Mike Moustakis cannot play shortstop. He will not I mean, be playing shortstop for this team. I um, mean... <laughs> he, no, I'm, I correct myself. Sorry, third, second, first. <laughs> But I think what I would what He's I what I want to point out is real that, spots. <laughs> what I want to point out is that less than this being about Mike Moustakas specifically, it is the continuation of a trend that we've seen this spring or really this winter, which is there's a lot of non-roster guys in camp right now who have a shot at making this team, and I don't know if any of them will, but the opportunity is there. And I think it speaks mostly to the point 
where the White Sox are kind of starting another rebuilding process. There's not, there's maybe, you know, more opportunity for these guys because there's just not as many locked down roster spots. But as you look across that list of 69 names that are at spring training, you've got guys like Moustakis, like uh, Pilar, you know, there's guys like uh, Rafael Ortega who are here. And then certainly the bullpen is full of them, you know, guys who could be on this team, be a Chad Cool or Corey Knable or Dominic Leone, whatever, you know, take your pick. It sure seems like there's a lot of opportunity for these minor league signings to turn into major league jobs. And, uh, you know, we can go through it and be a little bit more specific at a later date. But I I think that the thing to watch when it comes to, you know, roster battles, which we always want to pay attention to at spring training, is that there's a bunch of guys that they just went and signed to minor league deals who might find themselves uh, on the major league roster come opening day. Did you say shortstop? Mistakenly, yes. Okay, no, I just I'm not I'm not trying to bag on you. I'm just I'm just genuinely wondering it because the last time I did find it, last time Mike Mustak has played shortstop, uh, July twenty eighth, two thousand eight, uh, in, in single A uh, with the Burlington Bees. Ooh, Wisconsin's no, finest uh, team. It was single A. It was single A. So I mean, you're not maybe maybe in his youth, maybe he's got something to prove. Maybe he wants to be a shortstop. Uh, anyways, uh, hey, hell, we played Tim Anderson there last year. Can't be worse. <laughs> oh boy, uh, breaking sure. bad on Timmy. I'm sorry, Tim. Uh, but you're right about that, Vin, with uh, all the non-roster invites and the potential guys that could make this uh, list. Uh, Herb, just give me a shout out if any of these guys are locked. Uh, Max Stassi? Lock. Yeah. All yes, right. lock. Yeah. Gavin Sheets? No. Danny Mendick? No. Kevin Pillar? No. All right. So outside of the catchers, which seem to be clear, Maldonado and Stassi, it seems like there's three bench spots open. So uh, we'll see how that all plays out. It's going to be interesting. There's a lot of uh, competition coming up with the rotation. Let's take a break. We'll hear from Chris Getz on one guy that won't have to face too much competition outside of the bidders because of all the people that want to trade for him and Dylan Cease. Uh, but then we'll also hear from Michael Soroka and Kopech on the upcoming competition for those jobs in the rotation. We want to let you know, though, about our friends over at Prize picks. I know Herb just won an entry over at Prize Picks. I won an entry over at Prize Pick. Uh, Evan Mobley and Brandon Miller cashed for me. Mm. I took more on their points, rebounds, and assists, and that was very fun. It's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can do this right before the Blackhawks game. It takes just about 60 seconds to make an entry. It's very simple to play. Again, if you just feel like a guy like Connor Bedard, maybe we'll uh, get some shots on goals. You can go look for the shots prop uh, on prospect uh, on prize picks and make your entry. Uh, they also also offer a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if uh, one of your players get injury injured for uh, football and basketball games. If you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is reboosted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sport sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go check out our friends over at prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO for a first deposit match up to $100. I know you knew that uh, I was going to just, you know, embarrass Trey Young. Oh, yeah. He's always embarrassing Trey Young. So I went over on Io's 19, 19 and a half points, rebounds, and assists, under on Trey Young's points, rebounds, and assists, which is like 37 just under and way over for Iowa. DeSumo got myself $60 a month, $20 investment. So go head over to prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO, Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. We're doing Charlie the Bacon Guy? Y- yes, sir. He is my favorite guy. He's based out of Woodridge, and he makes Kraft Bacon and Kraft Bacon Jams for over 35 different flavors. Bacon and Bacon Jams are also naturally cured, preservative-free products. No ingredients that Charlie can- can't produce himself or pronounce himself involved in the process unlike other store-bought bacon that stuff Ooh, he, i didn't even know how to pronounce that exorbiate and sodium exorbiate Ooh, for example vacuum sealed and freezes perfectly bacon lasts in the package for up to 60 days in the fridge one week after the seal is broken and nine months in the freezer the bacon jam it lasts 90 days in the fridge and one uh, up to one year in the freezer but of course once you open the bacon jam it won't be last than 90 days in your fridge because you'll be eating all of that. Check out the awesome merch, beanies, hats, t-shirts, stickers, and coffee mugs. What's your favorite flavor, Sean? Is it maple bacon? Is it chorizo? Is it French toast? 
honey chipotle or maui waui uh, i'm a big fan of the honey chipotle i like a little bit of sweet with a little bit of spice they also have honey chipotle cajun jardinera and raspberry chipotle and the bacon jam flavors right now the original bourbon mango habanero which is my jam and cherry jalapeno the bacon jam goes perfectly with anything just put it on scrambled eggs toast Crackers, burgers, grilled cheese, charcuterie boards, cinnamon rolls. Woo, that's a new new thing. Pizza, or Charlie's favorite, the spoon. The Bacon Vault, it's all the flavors that he's made in the past. If you're not currently available, give call, uh, Charlie about two weeks, and he'll make it for you. That's personal service that you can't beat and you can't find anywhere else. Starting now, you could save 10% on your order at charliethebaconguy.com when you use the code CHGO at checkout. You can pick it up, which is the most efficient way for you to do it, or he can deliver it to you, or meet you at halfway, or even ship it. He makes the bacon so you can bring it home. And Charlie's going to be apparently in studio uh, on the 20th, so we are going to have, 20th. hopefully, yeah. some very, very, very delicious samples to tell you s- about. Usually comes in for the Hawks show, so I've got to get here early. 20th. Because yeah, yeah. oh, 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 oh. the last time he came in, all the bacon was gone. What? Greedy son of bitches. Oh, you get in here early. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, let's head over to Dylan Cease. Uh, if you woke up this morning like I did to Jeff Passan's tweet, I think someone from the Baltimore Beat had it first. So I want to give. Uh, I, I'll try to give them credit. I don't know their name off the top of the head uh, of my head. Uh, but Kyle Bradish is going to hit the IL with a tear in his UCL, a Orioles starter that had an ERA under three last year. And John Means will not be making in the uh, opening day roster due to health setback. So that is why Jesse Rogers starts this clip with Chris Getz asking about Baltimore. Give him a call. You can play the Getz on Cease one. You're all good. Is Baltimore called today? <laughs> they have a couple pitching injuries. Uh, they have not called today. Okay, all right. Chris, what, what Jesse just asked you, I mean, we talked to Dylan yesterday, and Dylan was great about offseason and focus now. I mean, is there anything you've said to him about spring training that you can count on this or count on that or just, you know, keep your keep your mind open like you did and something could happen, but right now you're our opening day starter? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've said this many times. I don't worry about Dylan Cease just okay. because of the makeup of, of the pitcher. Um, I, I know that he, every day it's about, you know, sharpening his craft and trying to get better. Um, I know that, um, you know, he had a tremendous offseason. He spoke about, you know, he's had some tricep soreness in the past and, and to go through a smooth offseason without any sort of small hiccup. Um, I know he's well positioned for, for the season and he's going to prepare for opening day. And at this point, it looks like it's going to be with the White Sox. Even if Baltimore didn't call the day, do you have to remain open to injuries in spring opening needs are creating demand? And do you have to kind of keep those channels open even if you're preparing to have Dylan as your opening day starter now? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, you know, I've got to look at, you know, for the, the greater health of the organization, right? And if there's an opportunity that, that presents itself to, to make our major league club, you know, good this year, but also years to come, then we've got to uh, consider something like that. And, you know, in, in regards to in, outside interest, um, that can be dictated by a, a lot of different things. And, and, you know, you speak of injuries that may happen or lack of productivity um, with other clubs, that could be a factor. Um, you know, Dylan is, is an important piece of this organization. Um, and, you know, he's preparing well. But, yeah, we're open-minded to whether it be Dylan or anyone else if um, we feel like it can help the organization both short-term and long-term. And that is Chris Getz, the White Sox general manager on Dylan Cease Rumors, along with the Baltimore murmurings, along with Bradish in means. Uh, Gunnar Henderson has an oblique aggravation. He will likely miss opening day, or he will likely be around for opening day. And then uh, Samuel Basalo, who we thought maybe, if the White Sox were lucky, would be included in a Cease trade. He has a strict stress fracture and won't catch until April. Vinny, what'd you take away from at least that part of the Chris Getz one, just because it was so different from the Moustakas one? Uh, it's more Dylan Cease talk, but it still seems like he's the opening day starter um, until a godfather package is dropped. Yeah, I mean, you summed it up and certainly Chris uh, kind of said it all there. I think, uh, you know, the thing that jumped out to me is Chris saying going as far to say hey it sure seems like he's going to start on opening day for the White Sox I mean you you know you, you talk about a guy who has made a habit of not taking anything off the table and he's pointing here with a little a little bit more certainty than he normally speaks with so I think that that uh you know jumped out at me uh you know maybe he has a 
uh, uh, an understanding through a lot of the conversations that he had during the offseason that this is just not the time for this deal to be made. And as we get closer to the trade deadline, that might, uh, you know, see some more desperation and some and some more uh, likelihood of that deal being completed. That being said, this is exactly what we've been talking about for weeks as the kind of thing that can change to to change the mindset of these teams who were, you know, maybe looking at the White Sox quote unquote demands and thinking that it was a little too much. I mean, you got two members of that Baltimore rotation being yanked right out of it. That's one of the most competitive rotations in baseball and for, or I'm sorry, most competitive divisions in baseball. And that sort of thing can really, you know, change things around for a team that won that division last year. Maybe now the Yankees are, are you know, looking to leapfrog them. Maybe now uh, the Blue Jays uh, or the Rays are looking to leapfrog them. How do the Orioles stay competitive in a division where they just lost two of their uh, more uh, uh, promising starting pitchers? They maybe do it by going out and getting Dylan Cease. But, of course, there's nothing saying that that needs to happen now or by opening day. Uh, you know, it, it might take all the way to the trade deadline uh, if the Orioles are, as we talked about all offseason, intent on having all those highly rated prospects play for them for the next decade. And the thing is, too, with the Bradish injury, John Means is also not going to start the season on the major league roster, apparently, and uh, the injury you're talking about uh, with uh, Basillo, which is a minor leaguer. They traded away D.L. Hall, too, another person that they could have used in this rotation. So now they're depending on Cole Irvin, and I think his name is Tyler Wells. You know, I, I've never heard of Tyler Wells in my life before. He made a, so a, a start versus Sox. I'm yeah, sure. probably well. But, like, those are fourth and fifth starters that you weren't depending on this year that you have to gear down to in the AL East, as you said, Vinny, the most competitive division in Major League Baseball this year. And so do the Baltimore Orioles feel like, okay, we're just going to pause a little bit, the UCL tear, we're just going to have Bradish pitch through it, which as a not a doctor, I think it's a little, little, little weak, kind of kind of weird to pitch through a UCL tear, but it's their thing. Or are we going to go out and pursue something to make sure that our rotation is solid and go and get a guy that is posted every time he was asked to since, what, 2021? So it's up to them, and I think the White Sox, again, are in the driver's seat because of Chris Getz's steadfastness of just asking for what he wanted, and if you're not going to get what he wants, we'll just stay, we'll stand here and have Galen Cease be our guy on opening day. I was just, just oh, back to you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, my bad. I, I, I thought that would have been picked up. My, or Anyways, uh, Tyler Wells did start against the White Sox last year. Uh, they uh, got to him in early uh, through the first six innings, and then the bullpen specifically ran out six the Six innings, though? Pulled it. Uh, yeah, uh, they were Watch up for that glass. Three, three nothing. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're up three nothing uh, going into the six, and then the Sox bullpen blew it with four and two runs. Um, all right, so Cease obviously seems locked in for the White Sox rotation, though, but we know that there's competition maybe outside of... Dylan Cease and uh, Eric Fetty. Uh, uh, so two of those guys, Michael Kopech and uh, Michael Soroka, who we are lovingly referring to as uh, the Michaels, uh, spoke today. Uh, who do you think is more important to hear from first? Whether Kopech, the guy who's been here and obviously fans have been more connected to uh, throughout his you know past six years, I think, in the White Sox organization, or Soroka, the new guy who might be having a lot of promise bringing uh, f with him from Atlanta. Oh, Kopech. I think Michael Kopech is is probably one of the more uh, bigger focal points of the spring camp for the White Sox. Are, is he going to clean that stuff up? Is Brian Bannister going to have the effect that, that we thought? And uh, certainly Michael Kopech touched on trying to uh, kind of move on from all the bad things that happened last year. And part of that bad things was uh, not really the cleanest start to his offseason. Here he is start talking about the clean offseason that he's had. And here is about seven minutes of Kopech talking about that competition for this White Sox rotation this year. Clean slate, I think, is a good way to describe it. Um, you know, last year, as a team, we had plenty of woes. As an individual, I had just as many. Um, so to, to come in feeling healthy, ready to go, ready to compete, and ready to to build a new culture within the team, I think is something that we're all pretty fixated on. Um, so 
yeah, kind of a, a fresh start. Um, there's not a whole lot of pressure on us because there's not much expectations out of us. So I think we have uh, the ability to, to impress a lot easier than people might expect. Pedro talked a couple times about putting last year behind everyone, but I imagine you looked at it after it was done. What did you take away from it, you know, personally from from the 2023 season? What did you learn from it? Um, I, I think there's a lot to learn from it. Um, a lot of it just being. Um, Preparation and effort. Um, and, you know, I think that we didn't play the game the way that we, we could have played the game, um, and I, I think a lot of that just comes from um, you know, taking it serious and preparing as a professional um, on an individual level and as a team. Like I said, um, but I think that we can do a better job of that, and uh, I, I think that's already being addressed here in the early days. So it's good to see. Mike, you look around the clubhouse and. From a year ago, there's no more Giolito, there's no more Lynn, there's no more Clevenger, Dylan's obviously uh, on the trade block, but you're still here. And it's almost like a fresh new beginning for the entire pitching staff along with Michael Pope. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's uh, it's a new feeling for sure. You get used to, to faces, you make friends, you make relationships, you, you have guys that you look at as leaders, and then when they're not around, um, you know, different responsibilities and roles fall to different people in the clubhouse, um, different, um, I guess, for lack of better terms, vibes going around, um, and, and the team has to kind of get to know each other in a new way. Um, so I, I think for for like me and Dylan personally right now, um, this is a, a brand new feeling, um, and we're we're trying to take advantage of that and take responsibility as uh, guys that have been on the staff. To that point, <clears throat> Michael, was this offseason strange with all the trade rumors for, for Dylan and other guys? Were you checking your phone, seeing the reports as well? No, I was not checking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of hang up baseball when baseball is over with, and then I come back and I find out everything that happened. So um, it's a lot of new faces. It's a, like I said, it's a, kind of a, a new scene here for us. But um, you know, with those adjustments comes a lot of opportunity. And so I, I, I think that that's what we have to look at. It. So we were yeah. talking about the new faces. Like, it seems like high character guys. I mean, Snodgis now is the latest. Jesse Chavez has been around. Yeah. There's others. Do you think there's a, sounds like a concerted effort to bring in those kind of guys? Absolutely. Uh, on staff as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, that, that has been very intentional. And with the, the, the new guys being here, um, the ones I've gotten to talk to, the staff I've gotten to talk to, um, it seems like we're all. You know, moving in the same direction, a lot of good people, to say the least, um, and you know, th that kind of creates that culture that Pedro talks about. Um, so it's exciting to see how, how that's going to all come together, but it seems like it's moving in the right direction. What was your off-season focus this year? What did you kind of work on? Um, just, you know, mainly getting healthy. Um, you know, I've been banged up the past couple of years, and had an opportunity to go and you know, clean some stuff up and you know, feel good again. Um, so I, I got myself um, in pretty good shape and you know, continued throwing and working on um, tightening some stuff up on the mound, but um, just kind of fine tuning everything and, and coming in ready to go and not feeling like I'm behind the eight ball. Are you carrying so, more weight and muscle this year? Uh, I actually say? lost about 20 pounds. Really? Yeah. Huh. As far as, far as uh, you, you never complained about <clears throat> your leg or the strength of your leg, you just went out there and competed. Um, do you feel this year coming in that you're, you're going to have that full strength and that you can be Michael Kopech again? Yeah, I do. Um, right now, I feel like I'm able to move well. The ball's coming out well. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting into some positions that were difficult for me to get into in the past couple of years. So um, my, my movement patterns are kind of cleaned up and everything, and I'm excited to see how that translates to the mound. What has it been like working with Brian Bannister? He, we saw him in your bullpen yesterday. You know, having a, a pretty in-depth conversation with you. What has it been like working with him? I think he brings a lot to the table. I think he's got a lot to offer as far as pitch design and you know, how I can make some adjustments to clean things up. He's been around some really good pitchers, um, some good staffs. And uh, you know, I, I think that there's some things last year that I wasn't happy with that we're already addressing right now. Um, so it's exciting to see how, how that's going to kind of change the approach I have to anyway, the pitches I think, this year. I, I think back to that day back in December of 2016 when the trade was made and you brought to this organization. And the expectations 
of you were so high because you were such a flamethrower out there. Mm -hmm. If you got to the point where you're like, man, it's got to turn around, I've got to deliver because I know the picture that people thought I was going to be and I need to be. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily the pressure what people expect from me. That's, uh, that's something I'm trying to live up to, but it's more so what I expect of myself. Um, I know that I have capabilities that I haven't shown at this level yet, and um, there's still still that edge that I, I, I want to be able to you know, provide that to the team and help the team you know, compete to win a championship. Um, and in order to do that, I need to you know, live up to my potential. Um, so yeah, that's something that's very much a focus in mine. You know. People talked about uh, not wanting to talk about last year, putting everything in the, uh, in the past and moving forward. But is it valuable to remember the positives and the negatives as you, you know, learn about you know things in baseball when you move forward to 2024? Yeah, I think uh, I think a big part of you know having to bounce back here is understanding what you're putting behind you. So um, you know we don't want to dwell on that. To, to reiterate what Pedro's saying, but at the same time, we need to learn from the mistakes that were going on. Um, and so to, to recognize those and address those and to not go back to those, I think is important. In simplest terms, might like 30 plus starts be a goal for you? Yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, that was my goal last year, and unfortunately I fell short of that. Um, still a goal of mine this year as far as an individual goal, but right now, um, you know, I, I think that we're all kind of focused on the team goal right now and getting, the, getting everything to click and come together and, you know, move in the right direction and prepare for a winning season. You're throwing to Ronaldo, you know, it's just one session. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he communicates well. He came up to me before the bullpen, he came up to me after the bullpen. Um, aside from what you guys saw outside here in the clubhouse, um, he wants to <clears throat> he wants to have a game plan. He wants to address what we're working on. He wants to kind of analyze what we have worked on, um, and I think that speaks to the professionalism in him. And uh, I know he's coming from an organization that, that does things like that. Um, so I'm excited to get to work with him a little bit more. But the, the little bit that I have has been a good experience. That's White Sox pitcher Michael Kopech. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to let you know about some of our sponsors, and then we'll go- jump into uh, a little bit of a discussion on Michael Kopech, and then we'll hear from the other Michael, Michael Soroka. We want to let you know, though, about our friends over at Circa Sportsbook. They have tight money line splits and a low hold model where games will strive to be a minus 110 split on the Circa Sports menu, unlike other sports books, which may use a minus 115 or minus 120 split. Circa keeps as little money as possible on large market bets like futures and golf tournaments, especially compared to other books, which allows them to keep the lines most advantageous for you you the better they encourage you to download and explore all sports betting apps available to compare lines from each sports book to make sure you are getting the best line possible to lay your money down on and because they are the world's largest sports book you will know that most of if not all the time you will get the best line possible to bet on and there are real people behind the circus sports brand who resolve issues in a timely fashion unlike other books who use chat bots who you could have you waiting for you know two three four possible weeks uh, until answering your request and all aspects of the app are being run by the same team that runs the main circus sports book at circa resort and casino in las vegas so download circus sports illinois at, at the Cir- sorry download the circus sports illinois app at circus sports.com slash illinois dash app at circus sports.com slash illinois dash app to sign up today also be on the lookout for circa events watch parties and tailgates if you are something you know me you have if you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER, 1-800-426-2537, or text GMB to 833-234. Visit AreYouReallyWinning.com. And what's next, Reed, Sean? Uh, CHGO events, Herb. CHGO events. I am a CHGO diehard member, so are you, Sean. But I don't know if you recall that we had a CHGO takeover at the United Center with our Bulls team. That event was with the Minnesota Timberwolves. It was down by 20-plus early, and so... Having our audience there that day seemed like foolhardy, and it seemed like we were going to have a bad day. But no, they came back and had one of the most exciting games that the Bulls have had this year. You, right there at home, can be a part of that audience with Big Dave, with Matt Peck, with Will Gottlieb, or in the future with us. We're going to be doing a couple CHGO takeovers, and that's the type of stuff that CHGO events brings to the table. If you are not a CHGO diehard already, what are you waiting for? 
It's the perfect time to get that right now because you get a free T-shirt, 20% off of merch. There's the picture Sarah's showing on the screen. 20% off of merch, 20% off of events like the CHGO tailgates we have with the CHGO Bears, the events we have, live shows with us, or the CHGO takeovers like they're going to have with the Blackhawks, which is already sold out. But you'll be the first person to know when you become a CHGO diehard when we have these events. So the next one, as I said, is February 25th for the Chris Chelios takeover event when they have their jersey retirement, but it's already sold out. So make sure you become a CHO diehard so we'll send you out the information before we send out everybody else. You'll know when the event is. So allchgo.com, become a diehard today, and you can join us on these CHGO events and takeovers. Thank you so much, Herb. Uh, let's go over to Michael Kopech. Uh, I thought it was very funny last year when he said his goal was to pitch 180 innings. I think it's a little bit more uh, easy to digest when he says 30 starts here. Uh, what do we expect for Kopech? And two, like, have we heard more clarification on what these starts may look like? It didn't seem like we've gotten too much insight on what Kopech wants to change. We know that he's made some progress so far with Brian Bannister on changing things, but it doesn't seem like we've gotten too much insight on what exactly is being done with the uh, with with Kopech just yet. Sure, and I think uh, you know, like a lot of the things that we've been talking about here in the last couple of days, that's probably something that will evolve over the course of the next month and a half. Uh, you know, Brian Bannister was out there uh, today doing similar stuff with pitchers that he was when I talked about what he was doing with Michael Kopech yesterday, and I think he was literally introducing himself to somebody. Uh, I, I don't remember who it was. Uh, it it might have been Chad Cool. It might have been, oh, it was Nick Nestrini. That's who it was. He literally shook his hand, you know, for the first time meeting him in person. So this is, a, you know, the very beginning of that process. And I think that you will see Brian Bannister have a big effect on Michael Kopech. But at the end of the day, Michael Kopech's done this before. He has had success in the big leagues before. We didn't see a lot of it last year. Um, I think Chris Getz has talked over and over again about how the improved defense should help pitchers stay more in the strike zone, be more confident staying in the strike zone. Michael Kopech led the American League in walks last year. Uh, you know, you can put those two things together. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's just a lot of things that he needs to fix because last year looked really, really ugly at times. Um, I think he probably has some idea of what that wants to be on, him, on his own, but he's also got a pretty big um, support staff here quite literally a staff here to help him do that, whether that's Ethan Katz, whether that's Brian Bannister. Remember the White Sox have a new assistant pitching coach in Matt Wise. And you heard uh, Michael Kopech asked about Martin Maldonado, who is out there and visibly having pretty in-depth conversations with these guys, both before and after the bullpens, as Michael mentioned. So I think that there's a lot of new that can help Michael Kopech attack things from a different angle. But I think at the same time, he can attack things at, an angle that he's probably got more in his mind and say, listen, I, I took a big league mound and I had some really good moments. Let's get back to that guy. Let's get back to that. I know how I did that before. Now it's just a matter of making it happen. When you hear the 30 starts, or well, at least I did, I was like, Ugh, that's a little too much. But he finished with 27 starts last year and 30 appearances. So it's not that far-fetched for him to get to that number but I would more want to focus on how long you last in those starts. And I got it. Posting, as we talked about, is important. And having only like 44 people last year getting over that 30 uh, start mark is a thing. So it's not a thing that used to be kind of like commonplace. You get 30 starts a year from any starting pitcher. But I think Michael Kopech has more of a realistic goal than Sean said, the 180 innings that he was uh, aiming for last year. I don't mind setting big goals and trying to hit them, but I want to set realistic goals. And it seems like he's more realistic in with what he is at now at this point in his career right now. And 30 starts, I think it will speak to his both pitching well and him pitching deep into games because there's more options this year to replace Michael Kopech if he doesn't pitch that well. He'll probably, you know, last year, the 27 starts, he got taken out at the end, I think mostly because maintenance and other things they wanted to work on. But I think 30 starts is a good number for him to aim for, and I hope he's also within there going a little more than the five-and-dime dive than he's used to. Yeah, absolutely, and I think he's 
got that workload. He's gone from 11,000 pitches in 2021 to 2,000 pitches in 2022 to, in 2023, uh, 2,430 pitches. And two, uh, Ajay uh, Patel, who runs a lot of data on Twitter that I follow, uh, has his own Stuff Plus metric, and he broke it down by innings. And mm-hmm. I got Michael Kopech's fastballs by innings. And when you look at innings six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, obviously not a ton of uh, examples or not, not a ton of sample size, 88 pitches, 33 three pitches, 11 pitches, 26 pitches, but in those six, seven, eight, and ninth innings, 113 stuff plus, 116 stuff plus, 141 stuff plus, 112 stuff plus, his average 107. So he's higher in those later innings when he gets to there. It's all about being more effective and more efficient with those pitches. If he does have 2,403 pitches or whatever, or maybe he's able to be a little bit more efficient and gets a 2,600, right? Is he going to be able to get to 130 innings just because he's not walking 90 guys like you mentioned, Vinny, uh, leading the American League? It it really does seem like there is a quality pitcher within Michael Kopech. It does seem, especially when we're looking at all these guys, whether it be Soroka's injury pass, Flexen's ineffectiveness, it does seem like Kopech has kind of the best of both worlds where he has stuff, like true capital S stuff, and at least, unlike Garrett Crochet, a true starter's background where he's thrown 100-plus innings in multiple seasons before. And hopefully for Michael Kopech and the White Sox, their defense-first philosophy comes to fruition, and they pick up the ball behind him because it's more likely he's going to be trying to throw more strikes this year because he's more confident in the people behind him and then now lead to getting into that sixth inning and staying in in the sixth inning and then get into that seventh inning, maybe. Um, Because we've seen him when he's on one of the best pitchers at the top of the league. Anything else more on Kopech before we get to Soroka here, Ben? I'm muted, aren't I? There you go. I would just say that, you know, we heard a lot from Michael that we've heard from other players, uh, you know, and, and chiefly we've heard from Pedro. This team has a mindset of not of doing what you don't think they're going to do. And, and it's not a surprise for this time of year. But I think we heard Michael verbalize it. We heard Dylan verbalize it yesterday. We've heard Mike Soroka verbalize it today. Um, I think that you're going to continue to hear the kind of idea you know, I don't like to say us against the world, but the kind of idea that the people in that clubhouse are like, oh, they don't think we can do it and, and get a little bit of the chip on the shoulder. Um, I'm not saying it'll turn into wins, uh, but uh, if you want to know kind of what the mindset is, what the vibe in that clubhouse is, we're starting to hear that at this time of the year, again, not maybe a terrible surprise, but we are starting to hear that that might be what Pedro Grafol is pushing and what a lot of these players might be buying into a little bit, at least before uh, the, the, the actual games start being played. And it do, if it does turn into wins, I know no fans will be upset. And a guy who is used to some winning, uh, the Atlanta Braves, uh, he was a, at least on the World Series team in 2021, uh, is Michael Soroka. He just talked to the media about the differences between playing in Atlanta and Chicago and the expectations that he has in his new city. Here's Michael Soroka on Chicago. I'm excited about it. We just had a nice meeting about opportunity. Actually, it was uh, uh, awesome to be here. Um, you know, obviously we're changing a few things, and uh, that was one thing that uh, Skip made a, a point of letting us all know is that there's a lot of opportunity on the table here. Um, one of the players is uh, looking to take advantage. You're, you're meeting a lot of new people, but everybody's meeting a lot of new people. There's a lot of turnover here. What's that like? Tons. It's exciting. Um, you know, I've mentioned it a few times. I think there's a lot of guys in this uh, clubhouse that are fighting for careers um you know i think there's a lot of guys that think they have a lot more to give to this game and um you know that's uh, that's what makes a gritty team and i'm excited to be a part of that we asked you just a few weeks ago when you're at the event how you're feeling and you said you had a good good off season how do you feel you know getting ready to ramp it up now here it's really good yeah i got over my flu already so <laughs> i'm all uh, i'm all through with that i don't have to deal with that in camp um but yeah i feel really good um arm feels fresh and uh, hopefully ready to throw a lot of innings this year. What have the last few years kind of been like for you, and are you one of those guys that's trying to prove something here with the White Sox? Yeah, obviously the last couple of years have been uh, difficult getting back into it. and um, you know, Obviously having some, some success uh, so early on, you want to you wanna do it year in, year out. And then uh, obviously what happened took took three years out of out of my career but uh, I'm trying to get that on the back end now so um, you know just looking to, to stay the course that I'm on um, you know it, it basically it, it you know got to the point where you know last season I felt like things were really starting to click so 
uh, kind of continue that momentum into this year and um, yeah, like I said, go throw up a bunch of zeros. Coming Mike, from a championship organization, what is it? What do you think you can bring along? You know, you and Schuster, some of the guys that came from Atlanta, as far as mentality moving forward. Yeah, I think uh, you know it's all I've ever known was was uh, penance. Uh, we won the division every year since I got called up, which was uh, pretty crazy. And honestly, not a lot of those years we were picked to win the division either. Uh, I think that was uh, a chip on our shoulder every year over there. Was that you know we knew what we had and. Uh, again, I think there's a group of people over here that know this division's uh, wide open and we can go take that. So uh, that's always going to be the plan. Uh, go put the best foot forward and uh, go compete. So we talked to uh, Pedro yesterday and he had a chip on his shoulder. He referenced Dakota saying the White Sox have a 0% chance of getting to the postseason. Did he share that with you guys in the meeting? Or when you hear something like that, does that motivate you? It does. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, we, we try and uh, use our numbers and our analytics for what we can, but, you know, we're well aware that there's a there's a good number of things that, um, you know, aren't uh, true until we, we make it that. So uh, we're going to go out there and, and try and obviously reverse that one. Having a real fresh start uh, in a new organization, how, how good is that for you mentally, you know, moving forward saying, you know, I know I can pitch in the big leagues and I can start here with the White Sox? Yeah, it's it's exciting. Um, you know, when it when it first happened, uh, obviously there's lots of emotions leaving a, a team that drafted you, and um, you know I've been with them for eight or nine seasons. And, um, but move into an organization that, that really wanted me out there uh, was really important to me. So um, immediately, kind of talked to the pitching staff and uh, what they had for me, and they're they're excited to get me out there, and uh, I'm even more excited to be out there. When you when you go through an injury like the one you went through, does it change your perspective on the game a little bit and your mindset on like being able to play? Um, I mean a little bit. I mean it it definitely puts into perspective that this isn't forever. You know when you get drafted at 17 and uh, first few years in the minor leagues kind of roll by, you feel like you're going to be in this game forever, and uh, you know that's just not the case. So uh, definitely puts that in perspective a little bit, and you know you start talking to some cases around the league that have also dealt with some pretty big issues and. Uh, you find it's actually a lot more common than than you'd be led to think. It's just guys have dealt with it out of the spotlight. Um, obviously, mine happened well within it, and that's that's uh, one thing I'm I'm grateful for is youth. You know, I'm still only 26. Um, you know, hopefully, I do have lots of years ahead of me, and I'm gonna try and earn that. You talked to Jake Berger right about the Achilles injuries, and yep. you know, he was a fan favorite here. What, what did he share about his perseverance through that, and also dealing with the mental side as well? Yeah, he was great for me just to kind of keep going forward. Uh, I talked to him a lot. Um, you know, I talked to him about the plateaus that you hit and uh, the days where it doesn't seem like you're getting much better. And uh, he was uh, there for me to, to make sure that things just kept moving forward. So uh, very thankful for him and obviously wish him the best of luck in, uh, in Miami. What about uh, leadership? What have you learned about leadership? Is it something that can be taken or is it something that's earned? What, what, what do you see from your Perspective. Yeah, from my perspective here, obviously I'm I'm new. There's not a not a ton of people that know me here, and obviously the first thing that you got to go do is uh, earn, earn it. You know, I think that's going to be taking them out aggressively every every time I, I every time I get a chance to be out there, and, and you know I think people tend to follow that, and you know that's kind of how you build leadership, and and um, you make a, a clubhouse full of guys that uh, lead with you. What do you make of this group of pitchers and, and maybe the competition for a few of those spots in the rotation? Yeah, it's obviously I haven't got a chance to watch too, too much yet. But, you know, I, again, I think there's a lot of guys out there that, um, you know, feel that they have more to give. You know, I think there's some guys that have had some down years and, and know that they have more in them, uh, you know, including myself. So uh, competing with those guys is always fun. That's what uh, brings out the best to you. One guy you got to see is Schuster, obviously. What do you like about his game and getting uh, to know him over the last couple of years? Yeah, I got to know Jared quite a bit this year. Uh, this past year in, in AAA, uh, we were both kind of up and down a little bit and um, going through it. So um, Jared and I got really close and, and you know, I know he's he's always working every day to, to get to where he wants to be. So, um, you know, it's nice to have a familiar face over here too. And, 
Um, you know, Jared's uh, Jared's going to do his best to to get what he needs to on the table. I know he's been working on a few things this off season, so I'm excited to see what he's got. What kind of, what kind of indicated to you that things were clicking, uh, even while you know, being up and down last year? Innings, innings in a game, efficiency, strikeouts. Uh, just kind of got back to feeling like myself a little bit, and um, you know, although a couple of those games were in AAA. Um, <coughs> You know, it still got to the point where I felt like I didn't belong there anymore, and that's kind of how I felt when I first got called up. So that's uh, that's kind of what led me to believe that it was time to, to take a next step, and I'm very grateful an organization like the White Sox is uh, giving me that. Welcome back, and that is Michael Soroka, the young Michael Soroka. I think that's the thing that really caught me by surprise while listening to him. Uh, Michael Kopech had obviously setbacks in his own career. Uh, 2019 had to, or 2018 made his debut with the White Sox, and then had to have Tommy John, and then didn't uh, play in the 2020 season. But he is older than Michael Soroka, and Soroka a little bit of a different case. He's had. 40 games or so in Major League Baseball, but those have been a really good 40 games. Kopech, 100 games, 60 starts, 20 more starts than Soroka, but maybe not the same uh, results. Uh, what do we look at competition-wise when you see Kopech and Soroka? Is it the experience of Kopech that might stick out and maybe the loyalty to the organization or Soroka's youth and potential that we've seen, especially back in, uh, what, 2019 from Soroka? Yeah, I mean, I think both guys obviously have, uh, you know, you, you laid out the stories, they're pretty good. Um, I, I would think personally that Michael Kopech would be a guy who is uh, uh, certainly more likely to land a rotation spot than Mike Soroka. That doesn't mean that Mike Soroka isn't likely to land one, but I think that Kopech is a guy, they keep saying, we're going to give him every opportunity to be a starting pitcher. To me, that means it's a major league level. So, um, you know, if, if spring training stats can be misleading, which we heard Pedro Grafol talk about last year, it might not even matter exactly what Michael Kopech is doing in those Cactus League games. Give him the sh- give him the shot in April or May or June, you know, as long as it needs. That at least jibes kind of with what they've been saying. Now, when it comes to Soroka, maybe he's a guy who has to fight for a spot. I mean, we've talked about it. Dylan Cease has a spot. Eric Fetty has a spot. And Chris Getz says he expects Chris Flexen to be part of the major league rotation, too. If we're thinking Michael Kopech is going to get one of those spots, too, that only leaves one left. And uh, if there's 14 or 15 total guys competing for those five spots and four of them have those spots already, um, that's a lot of guys competing for one. Michael Soroka might be the the leading candidate for that fifth spot. Um, He's a guy who has shown that he can do it at the major league level. Um, But again, he's got to go show that he can do it this spring. He's a guy who's had to battle, obviously, as he talked about, a lot of health issues. And then last year on a very good Braves team that that had some very good starting pitchers, of course, uh, he was kind of on the bus between AAA and the major league. So it, it hasn't exactly been just, hey, you're healthy, all right, welcome back to the Major League rotation when he was with Atlanta. It might be that way with the White Sox, but I do think he has to go out there and prove it, and I think he's ready to prove it, as you heard him talking about. That's another theme we keep hearing in terms of the vibes with these guys, not the whole what we heard last year, right? The whole, we're going to prove that uh, 2022 White Sox were not the White Sox that, that uh, you know, that, that you thought that they were, uh, and then it I ended up that they were much worse, but the idea of each individual guy having to go and prove who he is. And in a sport where, you know, these guys do bounce around from team to team, maybe the, this is a more important prove it kind of spring because these guys, as Mike Soroka said, are playing for their careers. And yeah, I couldn't agree more because this is a second chance for him on a different team that doesn't have a lot of people with success in the past, at least the 11 pitchers that he'll be battling for that fifth spot, starter spot for. So I would think that he would have the leg up on most of the people in the rotation, the Schultons, the Tuki Toussaints of the world, because of those people's also having a bullpen work in their recent past. Mike Soroka uh, had a good year last year in Gwinnett, and then when he came up to the major leagues, struggled a little bit. But the one thing that he's been, he's been consistently not walking people, which is a godsend that's awesome to see that he is a person that pitches the ball over the plate not necessarily striking out a ton of people I think he's at an eight uh, strikeout per nine but a guy that just throws the ball over the plate hit it and it doesn't give up a bunch of home runs with that so if we can any type of capturing of that old 2019 Michael Soroka man 
The White Sox got found money, and for just one player in the Aaron Bummer, you already got a starter at Nicky Lopez for the most part. And if you get another starter out of Michael Soroka, it's a solid trade. We will see what happens. We got one more show tomorrow. You could join us at 5 p.m. Vinny will update us again. Day four from spring training. Uh, Vinny, any final thoughts from spring training that we didn't hit? Because you talked to uh, Chris Getz as well. Any names that might have come out from those uh, uh, Brian Bannister bullpen sessions? Or uh, did we hit everything? No, I think we hit basically everything from today. Obviously, we're looking at uh, trends that are developing. And I do think Bannister's one. He's, uh, he's getting down and dirty with everybody. No doubt about it. Have you gotten out My to guy. your tiki place yet? Not yet. That's in the plans, though. That's in the works. All right. We'll, we'll wait with bated breath for that uh, that news. That's Vinny Dubry. You can follow him at Vinny Dubry. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. I know uh, soon we'll have his uh, three things that he learned from today posted on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe. Hit that like button on your way out. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him at Wall 23 He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. Thank you to Sarah for producing the show. And Moose is now a White Sox. Uh, we'll talk more and more about Mike Moustakas' future with the Sox here on CHGO White Sox. I'm Sean Anderson. Goodbye. We all silly like the mayor.